Gathers, are you there? I think so. And Firestone, are you there? I am, but I couldn't hear a word you said this to lead into the program. Oh, uh, but we we can hear you now. We can hear you now. I think other people had problem too, but we can hear you now. How is that? Can you hear us better now? You're fine. Uh, all, right. all right. And just to make sure we're fine, because we're doing technical things. Hi, Bohem, am I coming through okay? Yeah, uh, there's a bit of an echo. I think you might have your screen running or something. Uh, but yeah, can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Well, everybody, now you see how we make the sausage around here. There is an echo. Uh, let's see if we can get rid of the echo. How's that? Worse. <laughs> Well, we usually have a little more engineering help on this thing, so we're just going to proceed through. Uh, no, it's, okay. Charlie, can you, can you hear me okay? I can. Good. All right, so uh, Charlie ran the Communications and Society program at Aston for many years, and you guys went deeply into some of the moral and public policy issues around uh, communications and technology. Sure. And, and, sure. Good. Right? And Bill, you were an Aspen Institute moderator, and you helped us understand kind of the fundamental philosophical issues that we, that we built Western society on. Uh, so I'm very thrilled to have both of you here. Um, Charlie, today's show is going to be on uh, news, truth, and propaganda. And Perhaps you can tee up some of the issues that we've been talking about. The reason we're replaying the show today is this has been a very interesting week. There's been all of this conversation about is Facebook being pushed too far because, because it is not curating and because Facebook essentially pulls for engagement, which then can pull for any kind of speech and then hate speech. This has been the week in which advertisers basically ganged up and pulled the trigger, and it's something we've not seen before. Um, so I wonder if you could just paint the landscape for us for how profound this is. And then, Bill, I'm going to bring you back a little bit later when we tee up what we'll be doing for our next show. So, Bill, let me let me uh, turn to Charlie for a moment. Then we'll turn to Bill. And then we're going to turn to episode 17. So go ahead, Charlie. Well, an, an advertiser boycott is obviously going to the to the jugular of a media enterprise. Um, I, I thought one of the more profound things I've heard is when I ran uh, the Aspen program was that sometime around 2010, somewhere in that period, social networks became social media. And when you think about that, it just changes the whole structure of what you're talking about. Social networks were trying to connect people to each other and each person was a node. And that was the purpose. It was more like a telecommunications entity. And that was the, kind, that was the approach that uh, people thought about when they passed this Section 230 that gave uh, immunity from liability 
for the moderating company. You want to have a certain amount of moderation. And by the way, there is quite a bit of moderation going on, even though we don't think, you know, we don't think it's nearly enough. Um, but social media is, uh, you know, selling eyeballs to advertisers and whatever way you want to think about media. And in this attention economy where we have information overload um, and attention is the scarcity, uh, it's really uh, to get attention, you need to appeal to emotion like fear, anger, sensationalism. And we've seen more and more of that in our society, um, sort of an all caps, uh, <laughs> we've gone to an all caps uh, type um, mode of communication. So uh, then along it's comes- It's kind of the been a perfect storm, right? We've had media that factionalizes us because since there's more of it and we don't have three networks, we can all hear our own thing. We go into our echo chamber the technology reinforces us and makes it more extreme, not unlike primaries get more extreme. They attempt to deploy technology to figure out what we're saying, and now a machine is trying to exercise judgment, and now both sides get upset that they're being censored, and we're basically left with a really powerful thing that we've built, which it turns out is acting on us, which suddenly this week we... And we've seen a lot of things change in the last couple of weeks in terms of views towards race, and and uh, and suddenly that's caught up with advertising, which is kind of astonishing. Yeah, I think the triggering uh, issue has been the approach, particularly of Facebook, towards political speech. Uh, I think that um, Zuckerberg has tried to look at his organization's approach from a kind of First Amendment approach, not that not that they're the government or that they have to apply First Amendment, but thinking about, oh, you wanna have as much free speech among politicians, that would be very important. Um, and his refusal to apply traditional terms and conditions or community standards to some of the political speech has led to um, a lot of backlash. Uh, and that was in fact a reaction to the conservative, uh, the conservative right who felt that um, that Facebook was being biased in the, the way it was moderating out some of their speech at an earlier time. So very complicated. Yes, uh, 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 perfect storm. Um, and just the last thing to say about it all is the, the way algorithms work is to, they, they've worked so well. They've worked too well because to get your attention, they find out, they listen to you, they say, well, what, and look at you, and they say, what, what serves your attention? What do you like? And then it gives you more and more and more, and of course, then you that's what you're looking at. So it just goes to a downward spiral in terms of um, the kind of uh, information that you watch and tune into. So We are going to go to this show in just a moment, the one that we did, but I'm now gonna add Bill Cathers, because what we're talking about here, which is the, way in which a society could slide into faction and how we need principles to govern that. This is not just a Facebook issue. This is what James Madison's, I guess I could say slaved over. That's not the right term. It's what says James Madison in, in Federalist number 10, because what we're going to get into on Friday on our more perfect, on our show about holding these truths is how these ideas go way back, all the way back to Plato and Aristotle. Well, I, you know, Charlie said so many insightful, important things there that I think are so rich to discuss the information overload Charlie was talking about. So if you want to go back uh, to Mortimer Adler, uh, the great cultural historian, uh, uh, Jacques Barzin that were involved right in the beginning with the Aspen Institute, that was one of the things they were talking about, Charlie, was that information overload. And information is not knowledge, and knowledge is not understanding. So what are the great ideas? What are these concepts? And so I think, you know, Adler would just, uh, he'd you know, lit him up right there with just that information overload. And, and as an educator, you have these SAT exams where kids have 2,000 definitions, these simple little synonyms. And, but if you ask somebody, what is meant by happiness, they wouldn't know or th know that that was a serious topic. Whereas Adler would say, when Jefferson says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the, the 
many people understood Aristotle's ethical definition of happiness at that time and what that meant. And, and so those ideas, what is happiness? What do we mean by a self-evident truth? What is justice? Madison Hirschberg is saying, when we get to the Constitution, what's the purpose of government? To help people pursue happiness. I think that'd be shocking to people today. Yeah. And how do you do that if if what what makes you happy is different from what makes me happy? And so what did they have in mind to come to terms with these concepts? And of course, justice is key. What is the just pursuit of that? So I think the the thing for us to think about at this time is this information overload. And that is to take time to sit and discuss a great idea. Then I and thought. I thought one other thing that Charlie said that yeah. I just think is, I don't want it to go by. Social networks yeah. became social media. Social networks became social media, Charlie said. I mean, I think that is so huge, what Charlie just pointed out there, because they don't act like media. They don't have the responsibility of media. They just keep acting as if they're a social network when they've taken on this role of media. And uh, and without gate gatekeepers and those type of things. And I want to point out. Go ahead, Peter. Yes. Well, just by way of background for people who might not know, when you speak of Mortimer Adler, uh, he was one of the founders of the Aspen Institute and created the great book series with Hutchinson from the University of Chicago. These are the readings that go back to Plato, to Aristotle, to the birth of the Enlightenment, to the understanding of how we got to our thinking of today. And we want to get into that Friday when we reconsider the founding of the U.S. And the principal reason is in this era of enormous change, like suddenly with the George Floyd protests, with changing of statues, with reconsidering uh, a restitution, with grappling with America, we have a generation that wants to bring about change. But the best way to bring about change in America, I think, to be prepared with what these original ideas were and what we've wrestled with here over 250 years, but in history over a couple thousand years. I was talking to a friend of mine to, last night. I think she's a millennial. She goes, why do we have to know that stuff if we're trying to think about change? Yeah, so Bill, right. why do we have to know that stuff and why are we gonna be doing the show we're doing on Friday? Well, you know, I think if you just, if you look at the great books behind me, the the, the proper name of them, it was great, a great tool for advertising the great books, but Hutchins refers to it as the great conversation. So what you have, what they've done is they have a conversation across the ages. And if someone were to think, well, the great books back there, that, that's the answer key. Well, it can't be the answer key. I mean, you have Adam Smith on economy and you have Marx on economy and you have John Maynard Keynes on an economy and you have Marx and Engels on the economy. So obviously you have difference of opinions there. And so to have this conversation, to join in, what are, what are people talking about? So if you go back to Aristotle, what the big break you have is a constitutional government. You're going to have a rule book. And Aristotle says, justice is the bond of men and states. Justice is the bond of men and states. Madison's describing this, you see. And to have that bond, you, you have to describe discuss what is just in a society. Today, people say no justice, no peace. I think that's a great interpretation of what Aristotle said. Justice is the bond of men and states. And so it, that discussion is a volatile discussion. Can and uh, you know, it starts right in the beginning. So for our readings for Friday, I have the Declaration of Independence, 1776 and 1777. You have African Americans petitioning the state of Massachusetts, and that comes from the annals of American history, these original documents. And they are petitioning the state of Massachusetts to live up to those ideals, okay? We embrace these ideals. They must be justly applied. And then you have the Seneca Falls Declaration of Women's Rights in 1848, rewriting the Declaration of Independence, uh, that all men and women are created equal. So we see this conversation that continues to today. Now what Jacques Barzin says in From Dawn to Decadence, his great book from 2000 and, and Jacques worked at the Aspen Institute, great cultural historian. And he said, because we have so much turmoil in our past, we have this issue of 
the framers are slaveholders and they, they don't include everybody in this vision. And you have all of this turmoil from the past. So Peter, what Jacques Barzin says is at some time, everybody wanted to wipe the slate clean. They, they let's just start anew. We're gonna reinvent government. We're gonna do these new things. And Barzin says, you, you don't separate yourself uh, uh, you know, just by ignoring it. These things continue to influence us. These ideas continue to influence us. And so uh, Barzin argues that, that you have an identity crisis today. And I think this is very insightful. He starts talking about the identity crisis people have. And he said, because they're trying to find themselves. And Barzin argues to find the self is a misnomer. The self is not found, it is made. And to make it from scratch with no knowledge of the past, he says, has left us kind of adrift. And so uh, uh, I think uh, Tocqueville says, talks about the importance of associations in this conversation. And so I think one of the things uh, we find is what C.S. Lewis says, we read to know we're not alone. We read to know we're not alone. And to find out that people have discussed these ideas, to get away from that flow of information that Charlie's talking about. Yeah. And what do we mean by these ideas, I think is uh, just one of the things we have to uh, address in, in this age that we're in. So on Friday's show, we will post ahead of time uh, some of the readings, which uh, which we will put up on uh, on it. And then uh, we will march through some of these founding ideas. We're going to march through uh, ways of constructing an argument. Because online today, people post a lot of crap. People don't know what an ad hominem argument is from a good argument. They don't know what the guardrails are to have a conversation. So we're going to get into all of that. So, Bill, we look forward to the Friday show. And, Charlie, you and I first met. When you ran a uh, Aspen Institute Socrates seminar in which we used these same readings, these same values based ideas to try to understand media and society. You want to give us a taste of how we apply these ideas to what we're about to look at? Well, I do want to actually what I'd like to do is go back yeah. to your uh, Madison, you know, the, your, yeah. your comment about Madison and Federalist yeah. 10. Because yeah. what Madison was doing there was arguing for repre basically representation. Um, as and the, the importance of representation. And I think that relates to the media of today because really what, actually I spent a career before I went to the Aspen Institute trying to get greater access to the media for more viewpoints. Now we have, in essence, everybody is a publisher. Now we have little d democracy in the sense that everybody is, is on the media as opposed to these gatekeepers that uh, have been alluded to who are kind of like representatives. So we have a, a kind of a similar situation playing out on the media as you had for the question of, uh, you know, how is represent how is representation de democratic? Um, I'm actually- You're right, we have, we have the mob without, uh, so Bill, this, is, this takes us back to the thought experiment that Plato ran and why we have a representative government and what uh, the founders and the enlightenment thought of a pure democracy, which is what the media is becoming. Yeah, you don't have too many agreements among all of these thinkers back here, but pure democracy is one that almost everyone rejects, you know, that's just like mob control. And that's why we have Tocqueville, his Democracy in America, an excerpt on the tyranny of the majority. And Tocqueville, brilliant insight, comes to the United States in 1835. And he says, democracy's with us. And you, the nobility better get ready. It's here and it's here to stay. And he tells us all the wonderful things about it. But he says, it is frightening. The tyranny of the majority, the idea that the majority can do anything they want. And he, he said, it is just frightening. And how do you have this check against the tyranny of the majority? And, and that idea that you have, that that unchecked power is- but We is, don't have unchecked power. We don't have unchecked power. And I, I don't know of any democracy where there was unchecked power. And, you know, there is mobs. That's not democracy. But when you have democracy and you have protection of individual liberties and you have uh, checks and balances and you have, uh, not not that they're working that great right now, um, but this is a very representative democracy that's 
in serious trouble right now. But I actually would argue I'm I'm actually much more of a little d Democrat, um, uh, more direct democracy uh, advocate. Uh, but it doesn't mean I totally agree with tyranny of the majority. Um, and, and you can't. And have you might also argue that perhaps understanding where this stuff came from is so vital right now at a time of change. You know, a simple example is. Uh, this big fight about whether we're supposed to wear a mask and am I free to do what I want? And this notion that, uh, well, actually this concept of liberty in our society, uh, going back to Locke, comes from liberty is not license, that, that it doesn't give you a license to go do something that harms someone else. But in a way, we have a cartoon version of America in our heads. We all have rights. We can do what we want with guns or we can do what we want with or without masks. And we have no responsibilities with the First Amendment. And there was a set of rigorous thinking that made this place and that came on through history. But when you ignore that and you give everybody a microphone, there's a certain hazard. That well, they, didn't, they, didn't adopt a, they didn't adopt a bill of responsibilities, did they? Um, Americans are great on rights, but maybe not as great on responsibilities. On the other hand, when uh, I would say when libertarian, when people who are advocates, civil libertarians, uh, hear something like that, they think responsibilities. When you start stressing responsibilities, it's state power, and they they worry about that. But certainly, as citizens of a society, we have responsibilities to the greater whole. And that also is part of the great conversation. Yeah, well, they, uh, I, I think, go ahead, Bill. Like go back to uh, what Charlie was saying about little d and, and advocating for that. Because what I heard you say before was you were advocating for more access to the media, more people being involved. I was. I was. D, before, right. before it right. got crazy. Exactly. And so what I'm saying now that, that, uh, Barzin talks about it as the demotic, the people, that the voice of the people is this pure thing. All you needed to have was more of that. And whoa, Barzin says, here's where we are. And what does Plato say in the Republic? He talks about the beast. And the beast is, is, is this kind of public opinion like we're talking about now. And he talks about the populist leader is really a prisoner of the beast. And the pa painting, the image that Plato draws is that they're in this canyon and the only thing they can hear is the echo of their own voices. And well, that's it, the echo chamber. Yes. And so I think we'll bring that up in the future. And, and to just look at um, uh, uh, what Plato is saying there. And I think that's what we're looking at is you get it, you have an echo chamber where you you say hateful things and people reinforce that and you talk to people who already share that bias. And so that uh, the responsibilities, the representative, the but rules me, of engagement, how do we do that now in this yeah. open wild I, west? So uh, First Amendment theory for a long time has suggested that uh, the proper analogy is a marketplace of ideas. Right. And, and forever, we have felt that uh, in the marketplace of ideas, truth will prevail since Milton. I don't know if Milton's in your books or not, but, yeah. um, uh, but you know, Ario Ari Ari Pachitica. And, right. you know, so we've, we've had this strong feeling that you know, truth will will out that uh, you answer bad, bad speech with more speech. Right. But I don't know that that works today. Um, oh, the problem right. is, just like democracy, there, you know, the worst form, except for every other form. I don't know that there's any other way to think about um, free speech and and free thought than to say it's, you know, you've got to be able to prevail in the marketplace that ultimately we will come to our senses and truth will, will win out. But that's part of what's going on in this uh, media uh, moderation issue. People and want the, the moderator to yeah. determine truth. Who determines the truth? The government, the corporation, the crowd, who? The individual? Yeah, but, uh, 
uh, I think this is right, right on, right on the issue. Isn't there a, a, another issue though, is it's just the rules of engagement. I mean, I saw Mortimer Adler on with William Buckley and, and, and I don't think they agreed one time. And Buckley had Adler on 48 times on firing line. It was his favorite guest because he said he explained things so well. And I told people, you can learn more in one hour, Charlie, because the rejoinders were so clear. And then the next week, Buckley could have Thomas Sowell on, and the next week he could have Huey Newton on. And the, and the discussions were so beneficial to watch. Mm -hmm. And, and when I, you know, first as an Adler scholar, just auditing at the Aspen Institute, what amazed me was the level of conversation when no one's determining what the truth is, but you couldn't get away with informal fallacy. And we have, look, in, in, in social media today, it pulls so easily for trolling and almost this psychology of, uh, you know, the other guy is wrong. And I can see this in me. I, I can see there's two Peters. There's the one who gets up and I'll just go beat up on somebody I've known for 30 years because what a complete idiot about the mass or something Trump did or whatever. And I'm not proud of that guy. And that's not the same guy that shows up in an Aspen seminar and sits and thinks about this stuff, right? So we are we are pulled away from our better angels or we are pulled into this other thing, which has something to do with human nature. And I think has a lot to do with the power of this participatory media to suck us in. It's no longer watching television. It gets at the limbic system. It gets you excited that you you say something and, and you know, Alex Jones gets a lot of attention and the little Alex Jones in you wants to get out. And so we are stuck with this very powerful machine, which we've invented in 10 years, much longer than we've invented thought and how to deal with these things. And that may be a good transition point to go to today's show that I think we have done a fabulous job of teeing up with two of the best thinkers I know, because in today's show, we're going to hear from Yael Eisenstadt, uh, who was a former CIA officer, national security advisor to Vice President Biden, and then was, because of her intelligence background, in charge of election security at, uh, at Facebook. And, uh, and she'll tell us what happens next. Um, so I want to thank you guys. And now we're going to go on to today's show. Bill, we'll see you on Friday. Uh, Charlie, I'm sure we'll have you back to these microphones. Sign up. Uh, great seeing you, Charlie. Same here. Fantastic. Got me thinking yeah. about all sorts of things. All right, gentlemen. Yeah. Great. Thank Take you. So care. Much. All right. Bye. Welcome to episode 17 of Quarantine. I'm Peter Hirschberg, and uh, we're joined this hour by my host, uh, Mickey McManus, and a wonderful group of people that are going to help us delve into news, truth, and propaganda. You know, from the very start, when we went on uh, very early in the lockdown, the whole concept behind this show was the kind of the realization that the changes that we were going through were immediate and yet had really long term implications. And we've always been trying to understand what does this mean for what we're building next? How do we organize? Because the decisions that are being made now, perhaps really in the next couple of months, are going to set the tone for the next generation. Not unlike after 9-11, the decisions we made set the tone for the next generation or, or for that matter, how we approached World War II. Um, we've talked earlier this week, last week, about cities. Clearly, downtowns will change a lot. Where we go, restaurants will change. Last time we talked about long versus short-term thinking and management, how we have to adopt a view of uh, complexity going forward. And we've talked about the economy. But there may be no area that for which there's a bigger long-term decision than how we appreciate what's true, uh, what, what we believe in, and uh, what we regard as news, and, and ultimately our minds. And that's the subject of today's show, news, truth, and, and propaganda. Uh, we're going to approach this First, by looking at all of this disinformation we're seeing, and, and if you've been, if, if you're on Facebook at all, you've seen the rise of crazy conspiracy theories and the polarization of the audience. And, and this is actually a thing. We're going to delve into the research and take a look at this. 
uh, with Yael Eisenstadt, who is a former national security official, public servant, and has studied this deeply. And Yael will help put this in the context that this is not just a thing going on right now. This is kind of part of an ongoing uh, disinformation campaign and also the nature of how technology works. Then we're going to speak with Craig Foreman. Craig runs McClatchy. They run the premier local newspapers in the nation, the papers like the Miami Star, the Kansas City Herald, papers up in Seattle, Modesto, and, the, and also the, the Sacramento Bee. Local news turns out to be incredibly important. So just as there's disinformation, we're relying on local news as never before. But the business models that have made disinformation possible are also hurt in local news. So how do we resolve that paradox? And we're going to see some really interesting findings uh, of some of the open innovation stuff that they've been doing. And then where did this all begin? Uh, it was, it was uh, many years ago that CNN launched. And with us today is Lisa Napoli, whose book, Up All Night, chronicles what's almost the butterfly effect, the beginning of our being news junkies. So we're going to put all of that together on today's show. And to begin with, let's talk about the fact that uh, we live in a disinformation environment. Uh, and Mick, you can join me for this as we kind of go through things. Um, by the way, we have a resource page. Uh, Omid, why don't we put that up? Hello, Mickey. Hey, um, Peter. How you doing? Um, just for, for the audience, if you want to follow along, at quarantine.today, we have a page of a lot of the research we did on this. And Omid, you can show that to us now. One of the first things that we have on this on this is a, is a link to both Yale's work, but also work from uh, Harvard's Misinformation Research Center. And that research points out that 29% of Americans think that the COVID uh, news coverage was exaggerated to damage President Trump. And, and about 31% of all Americans believe that the virus was purposely created and spread. So the amount of belief in stuff that is probably factually not true is huge uh, and has been exaggerated by this news environment. And this can be quantitatively shown. Uh, uh, several years ago, I was chairman of one of the first social media firms that, that aggregated data, that uh, aggregated data on the blogosphere. And you could see who linked to who. You could actually see conservatives just talking to conservatives, liberals talking to liberals, and America diverging into polarization. Well, let's take For those of you that are, that are as old as Peter, this is Technorati. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the beginning of telling news stories with metadata and stuff. Uh, but I want to show you some research that just came out two days ago. This is from the journal Nature. And what they did is they analyzed uh, Facebook and Twitter links, and they looked at how many they were, how quickly they grew, and which nodes got the most followers, because that tells you who has influence. And basically, uh, in this diagram, the red stuff are the anti-vaxxers or the un or untruth movements. The blue stuff is, is public health, and the green stuff is we haven't made up our mind yet. And basically, what this shows on the top is the red stuff got ahead of the blue stuff. And basically, the, the kind of the people who make stuff up are dominating our minds with, with um, faster growing uh, nodes. There's actually more people who believe in the truth, but the people who are propagating the untruth have more followers. And the, basically, they're playing offense and the other side's playing defense because public health didn't realize it was in a war. You can take a look at the next slide here. Um, and, and this shows the growth of this stuff over time. And basically, there's a bigger mass of red, which means more influence. And so if you're on Facebook and it looks like your friends are getting turned, they're getting turned because people are turning them and they're using the nature of the technology to help do this. And what's going on here is not some isolated thing because people woke up and decided to do a misinformation with COVID. This is an ongoing thing that arguably began with the nature of the business model, started, you know, we saw in the 2016 elections, and what we're seeing now in the realm of disinformation is a skirmish and a longer war that lead right up into the next elections. Uh, and if you go through the documents we put, you can, you can see all about it. It's kind of scary as heck. Now, I mentioned this to our next guest, and she said, well, welcome to my world, because Yael Eisenstadt is a former CIA officer she was national security advisor to Vice President Biden. She lived this stuff and then went off to Facebook to help them face it. Yell, welcome. I will bring Yell up. Hi there. Hi. Okay. Yeah. So all of us have somehow ended up 
in the world of, of kind of a black ops and systems that work against us that you have lived in, and you've also spent some time in the tech industry, and you also worked with Mickey at Autodesk. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can start a little bit with your public service and how we were kind of organized to defend ourselves, and then perhaps what happens as you showed up in the tech industry, because I think that will help us understand what's going on today. Uh, great. So we're going super dark in this episode, it sounds like. Um, thanks for having me. Welcome to my living room. It's a little bit odd that the world, for me of all people who works on this stuff, that I'm letting you all see my home now. My beautiful orange flowers on the table back there, everything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I started my career uh, as an analyst at the agency. Um, this was in right before September 11th, it was in early 2000. And, you know, this was a world where you can spend 20 years working on the same issue, becoming a true expert, spending all of your time digging in, trying to find the facts, trying to distill the noise from the facts, because at the end of the day, your job is to provide the most accurate information possible to the president. And so I uh, spent my life really trying to dissect good information from bad information, trying to understand and make sense of it. Um, and I left government in 2013, um, went off and did some other stuff. And around 2015, I started, uh, I mean, this is a little bit my story of what made me shift to the tech industry. In 2015, as our elections were starting to heat up, I just kind of had this realization that uh, for some crazy reason, it you know, I spent quite a few years overseas and one of my big parts of my public service life was trying to engage with people who weren't like-minded, trying to understand multiple perspectives, trying to check my own assumptions, trying to, you know, all of these things that kind of don't happen in the tech industry very much. And then 2015, I started thinking, why is it, that it was easier for me to sit down and have these conversations with suspected terrorists along the Somalia border than it is to talk to Americans anymore about any hot button political issue. And so I started focusing on how have we become this polarized? Um, I mean, polarization is not new. It's always existed from the beginning of time in the United States. There's always been multiple sides. But something felt very different around 2015 to me, and I started digging in into what is it that's exacerbating this polarization uh, in the U.S. And so I started digging in, and I started writing about it and speaking about it, and then Facebook called. And um, they asked me to come head a new team, uh, the head of elections integrity operations for their political advertising side. And to me at this point, I had really started to believe and say publicly that it seemed to me that social media and the way their businesses are run and the way their business models work are actually starting to become one of the biggest harms and threats to civil discourse and their to democracy. So if you're gonna offer me the opportunity to come try to help you fix that, um, it's impossible for someone like me to say no. And so that's how I ended up at Facebook. So yeah, um, when we when we were working together, and this was post post that era, and you wanted to really understand what was going on in tech, uh, and we'll get back to the Facebook for a second. But um, one of the things you said when I first when I first met you, it was just our first conversation. You said it was weird that it was easier to negotiate with Somali pirates than than Zuckerberg, and and that just like punched me in the gut. I was like, whoa, okay, and. Um, I want you to talk just a little bit about what happened um, with you trying to get Facebook to understand this. And can you also tell us how you told them how their mechanism kept pulling us to dark stuff and, and pulled for disinformation? Mm -hmm. um, sure, there's a lot to unpack in those questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not personally negotiate with Zuckerberg, but um, <laughs> just to be clear, um, I think it was a metaphor, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, you know, I was brought in, it is interesting, they they made the final offer to me one minute after um, Zuckerberg hearing ended, uh, the Senate hearing mm -hmm. that has 
become famous for some of the terrible statements like a senator asking how they make money. Um, so it was right when they were completely underwater for the way they had allowed Russia to interfere in our election. Um, so I was going in under the ba that backdrop. And before I said yes, I mean, I, I didn't need this job. I didn't, so I was very clear. I asked a lot of questions of the recruiter and said, I'm, this is how I work and don't hire me if you don't mean it. And the way I work is you have to understand how you got here in order to understand how to fix it. And just to kind of be high level and I can go more granular if you want, um, that was actually one of the most interesting things to me is nobody wanted to look backwards. I mean, I'm sure there were probably teams, listen, Facebook is a huge company and I worked on the business integrity side, which is really their advertising side. So there's also all these different silos, but from my team, I nobody wanted me to have the conversations. Actually, I shouldn't say nobody, nobody at the higher levels. I think people at the lower levels um, were really passionate about trying to do the right thing. For the higher levels, it was there was no appetite for me saying, for me asking questions. For me saying, well, not not what like what did the Russians do or did the Russians hack the elections or did the Russians do X, Y, or Z? It, to me, I was asking questions of what is it about this platform? What is it about our society? What is it about Facebook that made it so easy for this to happen? Mm -hmm. That made it so easy for manipulation to spread, made it so easy for outside influences. And so that was, those were the conversations people didn't want to have. I mean, you and I were joking earlier. <laughs> One of the things that always drives me a little bit crazy is when people say to me, or not to me, I'm sorry, when Facebook says, whether it's Mark Zuckerberg or whether it's Sheryl Sandberg, they love to say, we're so sorry, we're gonna do better. We couldn't have known this was gonna happen. Hmm. Nobody could have known this was gonna happen, but now that we know we'll do better. And I like to argue, well, actually there are people who could have known this was gonna happen, I guarantee you a big crop of people that worked at the CIA with me and who had studied the Soviet Union all through the Cold War could have told you this was going to happen if you'd ever actually engaged with true experts or if they really understood how Facebook worked in early days. And in fact, we had somebody, we had a KGB defector in 1985 specifically tell us this was going to happen. Actually, we have him with us today. So yeah. against this background, Let's now take a look at this tape from a KGB defector in 1985 laying out what he thought might just happen in America in the following couple of decades. To change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. The first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures. So the next stage is destabilization. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation. Uh, it's what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis. Oh my goodness. Schmucks, I love it. <laughs> um, 
you know, and he said the first part, the, uh, I, I watched the whole clip and we've got it on our, our advanced resources and Yaya has sent this to us. He said demoralization takes about uh, 10 to 15 years because you have to actually count on an entire generation of children growing up demoralized. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was just chilling. Uh, so, Yael, how long did you last at Facebook? What happened there? I mean, I lasted about six months. <laughs> so not very long. Um, about halfway into my time there, I told them very seriously. I went to the top of HR and I said, you hired me to help you with this problem. And it's a problem I care deeply about. I'm not here to rise up the ladder. I never want to be CEO. I'm not here for a power grab. I'm here because I fundamentally believe you have a huge role to play in our democracy, in how people see information and how people consume information. And if you don't allow me to act, empower me to do the job I was hired to do, I will leave. Um, and that's what happened. But Can we talk? Let's talk about the mechanism that went on here. So social media gets born, and on its surface, this is democratizing and wonderful. We all get to say something. Um, we know we're going to lose something of curation because there are more voices. But what goes on at Facebook, and what you saw a couple years before Roger McNamee's book came out, a couple years before Tristan Harris blew the whistle at the Center for Humane Technology, is you saw that uh, salacious stuff or stuff that got our attention, but it wasn't necessarily too that stuff just did better organically and got more ads and the rest of it than stuff that was true. So there was a mechanism built into Facebook that one, could amplify it, and two, because you could see how people thought, if you wanted to mess with us like the Russians, you knew what got our goat. And therefore, you could program stuff that could get us riled up, and that's the stuff that went flying up. That was the red stuff we saw. But that that increases ad sales, right? And their only business model is selling eyeballs. Right. So that's maybe what the core of this problem was, is you were flagging that your business model is kind of hard to change. So it's interesting. I, you know, at first I didn't fully understand the business model. So mm. at first I knew there was something wrong. I knew that the salacious content was winning. I started to believe we were being radicalized. So part of my work overseas was I ran a lot of our counter extremism programs, some of what we call the Hearts and Minds program um, in East Africa and and in Somali communities. And I actually started believing that Americans were being radicalized in the same way that some of the people that I had been working with a decade earlier had been. Now, people like Tristan, he understood the business model before I did. Like he definitely, and he and I worked together a bit over the summer, but he he um, and others were really talking about the attention economy. But in a nutshell, what's happening here is, It's not about this freedom of speech issue, right? It's not about shouldn't everybody have the right to say whatever they want. Um, We don't want Facebook to be the arbiters of truth. We don't want, yes, I agree with that. Everybody, I mean, well, not everybody. It depends on, there are certain restrictions, of course, but freedom of speech, I mean, I swore an oath to defend our constitution and freedom of speech is part of that. So obviously I believe in freedom of speech, but the way these platforms work is they have to segment us into these tighter and tighter categories so that they can sell us custom made ads, right? Now, what does that mean in practice? That means that they're gathering and hoovering up every ounce of data they have on us and not just on the platforms. They can follow us around the internet. And as they're hoovering up all of our human behavioral data, what it's doing is categorizing us and segmenting us into smaller and smaller categories. Now, if that is so that they can sell me a Nike versus a Reebok ad, that doesn't really bother me as much, right? Like, fine, you understand that I prefer New Balance over Nike or whatever. But that same tool can also be used by political operatives to sell us different versions and different messages about political realities, to drive wedges in between us and foment this, this these societal problems that we already have in the U.S. Mm. And and unfortunately, because their business model is about keeping our eyeballs on the screen, because the longer you're on this phone, the more data they're gathering on you, the more they can perfect their targeting practices. Well, how are they keeping us engaged? Whether it's YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, anything that has a free business model, they're keeping us engaged by ensuring that we want to see the next thing. So like on YouTube, the next thing is going to be a little more exciting and a little more interesting and a little more salacious than the last thing. 
And Guillaume Chazlo has done some amazing work. He was the former YouTube employee who had helped build the recommendation engine and or perfected, or I, I don't want to misrepresent what he did. Um, but he talks a lot about this. So if, in order to keep me engaged, you have to start driving me in a direction that's not going to make me go, oh, I'm bored, I'm going to go do something else. And it's been shown that this has created situations where conspiracy theories really had, they have a platform here. It's, he, he has been scraping YouTube uh, sites now. And he, I think it was him who showed, for example, you know, people go on to YouTube and they were looking for the NASA moon landing. And within like a few recommendations that are being shown flat earth conspiracies. Or, I mean, an example, a young girl goes on to YouTube to look at the swimsuits of 20 whatever year she's looking. And she starts getting served content and how to be anorexic or bulimic. And why? Because each thing is a little more salacious. So it's keeping her attention. Mm. So when people say, oh, but they're just serving you the information that you want to see. They're just bringing out who you already are. I would argue that that teenage girl who wanted to look at swimsuits was not necessarily saying, I want to be taught how to be bulimic. Mm. So this is I think this is very powerful. Yeah, this, you know, one of the things um, uh, you kind of helped me understand, and, you know, I, I was exploring sort of cognitive diversity at the time, and you, you and I were working on this sort of idea of how we could, how could have lifelong learning, but um, it's really hard to learn anything when your brain has been strip mined. And, and in a sense, this is almost the equivalent to before the EPA said, hey, you probably shouldn't be taking all of our most precious resources and dumping them in our water and poisoning our children. And in a sense, these, these free services in a, in a sense are, are maybe strip mining our cognition. And when we can't think, what do we do? We fall back on biases. We fall back on like safety. We fall back on other things. And there's no FDA or EPA for cognition yet. So there's nobody looking out for us. And I think you have been. I wanted to bring up one point. Um, you said you joined, you know, the CIA in 2000 or so, and you you signed the thing saying you would uphold the Constitution. You know, I think one of the things people don't understand is these civil servants that really are civil servants out here. We are here for you. You could have made a lot more money anywhere else, but you dedicated your life to be a civil servant. And, and tell us a little bit about what that feels like to be a civil servant and, and maybe watching what's happening right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're gonna take me down an emotional road now. Uh, <laughs> Listen, I have always been a civil servant at heart, which is also why I left the severance mm. on the table at Facebook. I mean, I could have kept more money, but to mm. me, it's more important to protect our democracy, to protect what, you know, than it is to protect the bottom line of that company. And, um, you know, right now, I think more than ever, people are, you know, we you see a lot of talk during this COVID situation of mm. the true heroes and, and the civil servants and the doctors and the nurses and the front line. What's really interesting when I was at Facebook, what people couldn't, I don't think they fully grasped that mindset of, I'm not trying to sound like I'm completely altruistic. I'm not trying to sound like I've got no selfish instincts. But at the end of the day, when I was in government, I knew who my customer was. I didn't have to worry about making money for anybody. My customer was the American people customer, my client, my whatever. And I didn't have to sit there and justify exactly how I was going to make the country money. There were other people who had to do that. I had to talk about how we were going to protect the country. Now, you shift to the private sector. And the problem is people with that sort of mindset, we're often viewed as cost centers, not revenue generators. Ah. Because now I'm the type of person who says, wait, can we slow down a little bit? Well, move fast and break things. Slowing down is not part of the bargain. Mm. We slow down and think about, and not just Facebook. I talk to a lot of tech startups, and whenever I say, that's a really interesting idea, but can we talk about the potential second and third tier consequences of this? And then I'll walk them through like the Black Mirror episode that they're not thinking about. <laughs> and they think it's interesting, but I can already see it like, whoa, that's going to slow down my potential to make a ton of money. To scale, scale is my least favorite word in the English language these days. I'm happy to explain why I say that. 
Um, it's actually an interesting thing about disinformation. I, I know I'm completely changing topics for a second, but I want to get to this word scale since this is supposed to be about disinformation. I love it. No, keep going. So one of the things we hear right now is, you know, I give credit where credit is due. Early on in this pandemic, we had, I mean, depending on when you consider early on, uh, we had the major platforms say we are going to do everything we can to ensure that we are highlighting factual information about this. They know it's a crisis. They don't, I think it's easier to get through the public relations part to say we don't want disinformation about COVID on our platforms. It's much harder when it comes to political speech, which I'm very happy to talk about at some point tonight, unless it's like midnight already. Um, but so they they say we're gonna combat disinformation. And, the, and I give them credit. I said, that's great. What's happened now? We're starting to see more and more reports that even though they say they're going to make sure that disinformation on COVID isn't on their platforms, it's not true. Unfortunately, there are still many videos that are going, we had the whole pandemic video, Infowars, according to Media Matters just the other day, is still showing uh, videos with misinformation. Now here's where that comes back to that word scale. Every time I try to propose any sort of solution to the political advertising policies at Facebook, one of the first questions was, well, will that scale to our 2 billion users? Well, no, it might not scale to your 2 billion users because I'm talking about this particular election in this particular country. And the idea that, that it has to be able to scale and everything has to be super quick, maybe that means you got too big. Because if you, can, if you have claimed that you are going to combat disinformation, and I believe you, I believe you want to combat disinformation on COVID, but you're not succeeding, that tells me that you can't actually handle it. And the bigger problem is actually the systemic reasons of why disinformation runs rampant on your platform as opposed to the whack-a-mole approach of what to take down. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. This is the only industry that gets away with this. Like, could you imagine in 2020 if the automobile industry said, we really do want to make sure that our cars are safe but we have so many cars on the road. So like we can only, 25% of them will get through the cracks and probably kill people. Do you think we'd be like, okay, great. We understand it's a big problem. So you keep doing your best. Whereas the tech industry gets to make their own rules. And so they can say, we're trying really hard to combat this disinformation, which could actually lead to people dying if they believe these conspiracy theories about COVID. But it's just so much. I mean, two point. Five, 2.6 billion people. Yeah, it's so hard. You're also up no. against. We're also up against here a bunch of other things, right? You have you, you, Americans believe in the rights of the First Amendment, but not necessarily the responsibilities of them. So you try to fight it, and you got a political fight going on. Mm -hmm. You have another heinous thing going on that right when this great conversation gets started about what do we do about this, COVID happens and Facebook becomes essential. Like we're um, all at home. So actually we need it to communicate. So it's something between letting it skate, but also these effects of demoralization that the KGB talked about, or just the strip mining, Mick, that you talk about. If all we're doing at home all day is being on Facebook, book, the, the unwinding, the crazy making effects increase. And one of the things that we see both in the that Harvard research or, or the KGB guy says is we're actually pretty vulnerable now. We're vulnerable because we have a health crisis. We're mm. at home. We're worried about what's going on with our work. So our, our ability to find something we have to believe in is different. We're kind of at a maximum off, you know, vulnerable state. I don't want to make it worse, but the point here is there's a reason that this COVID thing is an amplifier to this oh. election fighting, democracy fighting effect that we find ourselves in annoyingly right now. If I can offer two thoughts on that. Um, the vulnerability, that's the key word. So mm -hmm. it's the same things when I was doing the hearts and minds and counter extremism work. I was looking at what are the vulnerabilities that are making people susceptible to outside messages and outside influence. In that case, it was terrorist recruitment. And it always sort of broke down into like 
marginalization, being disaffected, not mm. believing that your government actually cares for you and limited exposure to other perspectives. Like there was a list of things that were pretty common that made people very vulnerable to manipulation. Mm. And now you sort of see some of the same stuff happening here in the US now, right? There are more and more with the income disparity, more and more people are feeling marginalized, mm. more and more people are feeling disaffected. Add on top of that, what's happening with COVID right now, and we are particularly vulnerable. And at that same time, while we're particularly vulnerable, what is happening? We're turning to Facebook more. Facebook's getting more and more of our data, our human behavioral data, at the time where we are most vulnerable. Mm. And lest you think I'm only pessimistic, I actually think there's some real interesting opportunities here, which we can get to, or your other guests, mm. I'm sure, will talk about um, in terms of. I think people are actually starting to see the value in facts in journalism and true information. But my concern is since mm. we're so vulnerable and we are turning to platforms like Facebook more and they're hoovering up more of our data, guess who's going to use that? Political operatives. When yeah, they start we're almost, it's like we're feeding a lot of information yeah. now so that Facebook is ready to help us completely throw overthrow the government and. I want to ask one last thing or, or actually just kind of glue this together. Yeah. The last thing that happened uh, that, that I know, you know, in terms of you, you, you decided after Facebook to come uh, to the West Coast and you spent maybe two days a week with Tristan trying to explore uh, policy advice and things like that. And actually, as Peter said, just before the COVID thing, you guys were having hearings on the Hill. You were raising awareness about irresponsible technology companies and how how can we regulate that like any complex system needs a regulator. The other thing you were doing, though, was three days a week. You were sitting with me and you were sitting at a place called Autodesk. And um, could you just give me one or two things about what happened in your time at Autodesk, uh, like with Andrew and, and kind of, you know, what what you saw as maybe a positive side? And then I think we should we should bring in Craig. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you reached out to me and and made this wacky, wacky proposition. Do you want to come hang out at Autodesk for five or six months? And be an intern, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like an exit level intern or something. Right. <laughs> um, and we just want you to challenge our assumptions. I was like, oh, you want to pay me to be me? Awesome. So what was really amazing about it, I didn't know much about Autodesk. Um, you know, for those who don't know, Autodesk is a software company. I didn't know this before going there, really, that kind of powers all of the software behind manufacturing and architecture and really interesting stuff. And so what I found while I was there, it did actually make me, it, it restored my faith in some of the tech industry because at the end of the day, Autodesk has paying customers. When you have paying customers, your job is actually to keep those customers and the way to keep those customers is to, live, to deliver the product that is useful for them as opposed to exploiting and manipulating them and making money off of them. And so what I did while I was there after poking around a bit, um, which I just thought was amazing, there's not so many companies that are willing to do this, was I asked really tough questions of the CEO, the C-suite, of everyone I spoke to about sort of the ethical use of data as more and more of Autodesk products were going online. Um, when they were talking about the next generation of the future of work, of all of these things, I would get to poke at them and say, but have you thought about if you do this, that this might happen? Or just because you can do this, should you? Let's look at the ethical implications. A lot of companies would be like, okay, naysayer, go sit in the corner. You're going to slow down our growth and slow down our profit margin. Whereas Autodesk, people were like, wow, that's so interesting. Let's talk about that. And so the cognitive diversity factor is when we talk about diversity in tech, in addition to just being still incredibly behind in terms of racial, gender, socioeconomic diversity, all the things that these companies are so far behind, but cognitive diversity as well. Because at Autodesk, the CEO himself, like we would intellectually spar over things that we disagreed on but with complete respect, and we made each other check our assumptions. I didn't really get to that point at Facebook. Anytime yeah. I asked a question, it was just kind of like, why are you bothering yeah, us? Well, I think, I think by the end of the Autodesk experience, you said, I want to have a live conversation with the CEO in front of all you know, 10,000 employees. Mm -hmm. And he said yes, and mm -hmm. it was electric. 
and, yeah. and uh, you know, it, anyway, so I mean, I think there's hope out there. And, and right I think, now, before before we go on to Craig and talk about some of the great stuff journalism is doing, I would like you to put your your CI analyst hat back on one more time. And I want to take a look at some of the disinformation we're seeing now and have you helped deconstruct yeah. it. So first of yeah. all, there's some crazy statements that we see out there. So Omid, if we can just take a look at this slide. For example, sometimes we see people saying there's no real scientific basis for believing that social distancing will be necessary. It's never been studied, right? So we have that set of things. Sometimes we just have completely goofy stuff that shows up like, well, hey, 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 this is COVID-19. It's not COVID-1, folks, said Kellyanne Conway. So you would think the people <laughs> charged in the World Health Organization have their facts and figures somehow. But okay, that's funny. But then here is something that here's some footage that we saw just the other day of these protests of people who are really pissed um, at, at everything. Let's take a look at this. It's not about COVID or about a virus. This is about gaining control over the human race and limiting population. Limiting population with a virus that was created in a lab and funded by the United States of America by several people in the United States of America, along with other countries. The U.S. and its five eyes intel partners points out COVID-19 broke out shortly after President Trump forced China into a phase one trade deal to reduce Chinese control of the U.S. economy. Now that China may be striking back, there is concern that the deep state, Democrat cabal and the big pharma are working to derail President Trump's re-election and force the American people into total submission and control. Christian Rose, One in America News. Okay, intelligence community, how did we end up here? <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Um, listen, again, we're vulnerable right now. Mm. As our KGB guy said, there's been many years put into the work of trying to drive these wedges into our already existing societal issues. I mean, we saw it with their fake Black Lives Matters pages that the Russians added uh, ran to mm. try to stir up racial issues. So. I know this might sound funny, but in defense of some of the protesters, I mean, they have legitimate fears and legitimate concerns and legitimate stress. And what they don't realize is that somebody out there is playing on that stress and that fears to feed them this information. Mm. I mean, the anti-vax community is the perfect example, um, which I think you have some reading on it. And I know we want to get to the other guests. So I won't go into that whole story, but this information preys on our vulnerabilities. And so a lot of the, you know, some of the protest movements, some people have really been digging in to see, is it really completely organic? Or is there a network of sites that are purposely, you know, you get someone, just to break it down, you get communities to like these pages or these Facebook pages, right? And so at first you think you're just liking a page of a movie star or a musician or, or a group of moms or whatever it is. And then that page starts to gain a lot of popularity. This is just one way that this happens. And then somebody else sort of buys over the page or you never really realize who owned the page to begin with. And then that page starts sending out information or ads or events to you and you start getting sucked in. And, and I don't wanna, I know it's very easy to just bash people who fall for these conspiracy theories, but I'd like to show a little bit of empathy for people who, don't realize they're being sucked in. I have very good, very smart friends who I will see the things they will repost on Facebook. And I can't spend my whole life saying, oh my gosh, do you realize that that source is actually linked to this source? Mm -hmm. It's actually a manipulated photo. Like it's, it's, it's a lot yeah, of- I would to, to second, to second that. In preparing for this, I actually spent a lot of time talking to people who I thought fell for wacky things. And but I and first I was going to make fun of them, but then I interviewed them, and we've actually been doing a project where we've been interviewing them. And what I'm learning, and because I want to show that empathy, because I think if we're going to make progress, we have to understand it. A lot of people don't know who to trust, right? They they don't they, they don't trust the government a whole lot. They don't trust business because of what went on. Uh, for various reasons, many have been through health things. They don't trust the doctors, and and along comes this other kind of stuff, right? Right. We're vulnerable people who want to get 
is one last thing on the health stuff. Um, and hopefully when I come back later, we can talk about some solutions to some yep. of this yep. that I'm yep. working mm -hmm. on. But on the health stuff, for example, um, we're vulnerable right now, for sure. And oh my gosh, I just lost my thoughts. I started thinking about solutions. So maybe I don't know what I was about to say. <laughs> but um, you know what? I'll come back to it. I can we'll come back. Yeah. I think this is a good stuff. setup though, yeah. you know, I'll for let's let's shift to Craig because I think this is wonderful. Yeah. Peter, you want to set set up your well, yeah, uh, so welcome Craig's now, a good Craig friend. Foreman. Craig is a dear friend. Craig is CEO of the McClatchy company that runs uh close to 30. The newspapers across America, including uh, nearby here, the Sacramento and Fresno Bees, the Kansas City Star, the Miami Herald, and, and many others. Uh, local news is essential. And of course, local news has been, you know, fighting its business model problems on the receiving end of the kind of things that are helping Facebook. Craig, welcome. One of the interesting things about you is you're not just a print guy, you're a digital guy. You spent many years at Yahoo and other digital companies creating the environment that now you and Yael are living with. That's, it's great to be with you. And that was that was quite a conversation, you know, in trying to help you here with the transition. <clears throat> I thought that the only good thing I could say is, it's paraphrasing, I think, Winston Churchill, Peter, um, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing when they've exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> and I think that's a transition uh, McClatchy itself, which is one of the oldest Northern California startups, 163 years old, is a fundamentally digital company. Uh, in March, because of the pandemic and proving the point that Yale was making about, and I guess you were making, the information that we do in our 30 cities across America is, is extremely essential. And I think that offers us some hope as we think about people distinguishing between um, the mass information that we can see through social we can talk about this distributed computing and the technology revolution that you and Mickey have been so much a part of and that I've become a part of for the last 20 years when I left big media to come to Silicon Valley and, and where we may go in terms of solution. But that essential connection with our communities, um, I'll, I'll encapsulate it this way. When, when a hurricane hits Miami and the Miami Herald reports that there's 10 feet of water in downtown Miami, that's not real news or even fake news, a term I don't think has much value. That's just news and people know it's truthful. And I think that's part of the reason why the essential nature of what news organizations do can be distinguished from some of the uh, broad-based social information, much of which is actually, as Yell said, disinformation. Also, you have found out anew what essential means and essential meant something different in each community. So one thing that became essential was just what businesses were open and the other thing was just as the story broke, it had different complexions in each city. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what essential meets, and then maybe we can tour the country as, as the virus goes from Seattle to Miami to the center of the country. Yeah, you know, I also think in terms of setting this up, and, and Yale mentioned the oath that uh, um, intelligence officers and anyone who serves in government takes about uh, upholding uh, the Constitution. You know, the founders were very, very thoughtful, and the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment to that Bill of Rights distinguishes between freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Freedom of religion is also, also in there, but there's a distinguishing characteristic that they thought of a couple hundred years ago, and I think that's a useful distinction. The, the three of us, we've been in Silicon Valley for two decades, and we've seen the expansion of access of information, and it's a powerful and in many ways a wonderful thing. Um, if you're under the age of 40, you've never known a world without the internet. Under the age of 30, you've never known a world without a powerful mobile device in your hands that makes the first computers we worked on uh, laughable. And if you're under the age of 20, you've never known a world without ubiquitous mobile broadband networks that meant that everyone is a producer of information and their free speech, thanks to the powerful platforms that Yale was describing, can get to a lot of people. That's great. And it can disinform or demoralize a lot of people not so great. And having worked at those platforms and helped build some of the, the ones you mentioned, Yahoo and uh, search companies in the early days as well, and you know this very well, Peter, sometimes the power of those platforms outpaces management's ability to actually govern those platforms. And I think that is a characteristic of what we've seen. For a company like McClatchy, we have a different definition of what's essential. Essential is credible, it's provable, it's urgent, it's solutions oriented, and it's deeply connected to the local communities in which we operate. So the business directory that you mentioned, 
was something that we created soon after the lockdown began as a simple way for local businesses to say they were still in operation. And I'm happy to say it's been one of the more useful things that's been available to just help people who are in this sudden situation um, understand what's possible in their community. One of the other interesting things is th this story, because you have so many communities, it's a different story in each community. For example, you have uh, properties up in the Pacific Northwest, and that those were the early warning indicators because that's mm -hmm. where the virus first showed up. Let's take a look at this slide, and perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about what it was like uh, it, when, when one of your papers first saw this pop on the radar. Yeah, you know, in the very early days, and of course, um, it's well documented elsewhere, so we won't take a lot of time with it, but the period between January when there was uh, 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 government um, feeling that the, 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 the outbreak was contained in the United States, um, we began to see at McClatchy in the Pacific Northwest, in just a minute on McClatchy, the 30 markets are basically the parts of America that has been growing faster than most of the country. So McClatchy is deeply of what sometimes is referred to as purple America. The Carolinas, the Raleigh News and Observer, the Charlotte Observer, uh, Georgia, Florida, you mentioned the Miami Herald, Mississippi, uh, the Biloxi Sun Herald, the Midwest, um, Kansas City Star, uh, uh, Wichita Eagle, and then the Pacific Northwest and here in California where we started in the Central Valley. In the Pacific Northwest and then here in California, especially the cruise ship, the Grand Princess, that some people will now recall was kept off offshore until we could figure out or until it was figured out where it could dock. The, the cases began as local stories. And it wasn't immediately apparent, I think, to everyone how deeply interconnected these uh, stories would become and how, how, how quickly um, this would become a, a global phenomenon. And I guess I should rephrase that. Um, it was known, but the pieces weren't put together. And to highlight a couple of things that we did, which I think talks about this power of distributed computing, in Miami, because of our coverage of travel and our coverage of the largely Florida-based cruise industry, which has been so hard hit by this pandemic, we created a crowdsource database to actually deliver the information that isn't being delivered by any other source, which is how many people on these cruise ships got ill and how many people passed away. The operating companies, diverse group of people, not under any federal or state uh, regulation. Oh, thanks for pulling pulling it up. It's still available at the Herald if anyone is, mm -hmm. is interested in continuing to collaborate or see. This is really the world's best database of the impact, health impact, of um, the malady on all of those cruise ships where people were getting sick and where we first gained public awareness of and how, you should how, point how out terrible that, that this It's not like you called up the cruise companies for the data. This was data journalism. You had to go get this. How did you yeah, get there it? are some stunning uh, data visualizations on there about what Carnival, for example, told you, but then what you were able to find out from other sources. By the way, and, this is a uh, slide on transparency. Yeah. This is which cruise companies would tell you about what went out, and the answer was mostly not. Yeah. Look, as as a as a CEO myself you have duties to shareholders and you have to follow laws. And there is no law that requires this information to be um, uh, provided to First Amendment protected, credible brands that have renown, such as the Miami Herald or the Charlotte Observer. <laughs> but technology allows credible news organizations to do reporting that we've never been able to do before. And this is something, mm -hmm. Peter, that you and I have talked about. It's expensive. It can be done in a well-organized, provable way, as we did in Miami, and we've done all over the 30 markets around the country that together make McClatchy. And it's a distinguishing characteristic of the real news aspect that actually has shown it's one of the reasons why we had 100 million unique users in those markets in March. Uh, we generally run about 65 or 75 million unique users. The mm. paradox that I think you also wanted to talk about, though, is while We've never had stronger audience, and I mentioned we're a digital business now, 50% subscription revenue, mm. thank heaven, because some of the eyeball engagement uh, 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 piece of what Yale was talking about, the platform's uh, success, is also a huge challenge and headwind for the news industry, even one that's as digital as McClatchy. And, and mm. why is that? It's because that over the last 10 or 15 years, something like $35 billion a year of advertising has left the news and newspaper business and gone elsewhere, mostly to the platform companies. 
And did the platform companies do anything wrong in doing that? Absolutely not. They built something that drove tremendous scale, as Yale said, and tremendous engagement. I was one of the people who helped do that. So I understand that. But one of the things that we found at the platform companies that worked, targeted advertising based on keywords, also tends to fall apart at the pace of change of essentialness. And what do I mean by that? A lot of ad technology companies have blocked advertising from appearing against terms that are thought to be of concern to an advertiser, coronavirus. Um, and that's because there's a natural negative association that some brands and some agencies believe is associated with bad news. What that misses and what that oversimplifies is two things. First, most people looking for that information are deeply engaged and active people who you do want to reach as an advertiser. And secondly, the technology that algorithmically places relevant advertising, even in McClatchy, let alone much smaller sites, can continue to do that despite advertiser and agency efforts to stop it. We continue to do that advertising. Well, what so you're describing right now. Industry, the challenge for the news industry is to continue to drive that engagement for advertisers. Yeah, and you're describing another one of these effects of algorithmic systems, right? Which is the, si the system's just sitting out there picking keywords or picking things to insert it in. And then somebody says, if the word Corona or cruise ship or whatever shows up, don't do it. But it turns out that's all they care about Miami that day. And, and, you know, and now then who do you go talk to, right? Do you go talk to Martin Sorrell's company? Do you talk to the advertiser directly? So, you know, it's another one of these, where do I intercept it? Um, you also, in the politicization of this, um, you know, as it, it started, you know, in the, the story in the Pacific Northwest is it showed up. The story in Miami was data journalism. But at the Kansas City Star, uh, that was the that was kind of the the politicization of free speech, you know, of the various amendments and free speech and church coming up against things. So let's just I just want to show this and have you walk us through this for a little bit. So uh, in, in, in I guess it was in uh, in Missouri, the, it was like the governor said um, uh, we should not. The governor shut down, I guess it was, you know, a lot of assembly and then it wasn't a church issue. And then and, and but then the next day, uh, a whole bunch of people went out and defined defied that. Right. So this is the most politicized version of the stuff uh, where we're sitting literally this week. And I'm wondering, like, um, do people trust that? Do you get caught up in the in the polarization or do you yet again become the trusted source just to report out? how the sides are doing it. And, and what's is there a moderating role you can play in all of this goofy stuff that we saw before? We, we sometimes describe it, Peter, as the role that we play, brands <coughs> like the Kansas City Star or the Wichita Eagle. And this is a term you know well and Mickey knows well. We have a convening authority that I think mm -hmm. has been underappreciated as the challenge of the digital world has caught up with a newspaper company that you have to remember hit peak revenues in 2006. And why do I bring that up? Well, that was a decade after the first search companies went public. And, you know, you and I were working on some of those companies. And, and Peter, you know, 2006, social media was already well-established and Technorati, others, people were working on these tools. And that was peak newspaper revenue, right? And I remember giving a speech to the newspaper, what was then the Newspaper Association of America, saying, you know, this headwind is headed your way of digital advertising and digital disruption, you need to embrace it. And some people did, but many people are now still fighting the, the headwinds that were caused by coming to that perhaps a, a little too late. In yeah, a we're place, gonna... like, a place like the Midwest, yeah. um, we span from Belleville, Illinois, just east across the Mississippi from St. Louis to Wichita. And that basically is the entire spectrum in a microcosm of this debate in America between government's role in trying to keep us safe and healthy. The governor, it's a Kansas story, the governor of Kansas who, who put the, the, the quarantine into place for groups uh, greater than 10, and uh, the religious freedom question, which became the question in Kansas, and then was ultimately tested by the Kansas State Supreme Court that backed, backed the governor. We've seen this elsewhere, we've seen it in other states since. And so the job that we, we have at those, at those local news organizations, in those communities, and at McClatchy, is to remain engaged and essential and relevant and point out as a convener exactly what is going on. And it's not left or right or real or fake. It's just true. Yeah. Um, I want to point out to the audience that um, while we are a great trusted news source, the one thing you've learned not to trust about 
quarantine is the fact that we're not an hour one hour show. You now know that we go to about an hour and a it's half. It's quarantine. We're in blur's day. Because we're in quarantine where we get to make stuff up. So I point that out just for kind of everybody who's who's watching that we're going to uh, go to our next guest in a moment to help frame all this. And then I want to bring everybody back because we have a very rich conversation here yeah. with Yael, who has been working, looking at the problem and thinking of solutions. Uh, Craig, you who you know have been looking at a number of sides of this and every day are working with the business model. And with our next guest, uh, Lisa Napoli, who um, is a journalist who I've known for probably 20 years. And uh, I met her when she was with the New York Times. Uh, then she went, later went off to MSNBC as the first internet correspondent because in the early days of the internet, um, it was a curiosity. So on cable TV, they put on the internet person, kind of like you had the weather person. The weather person would tell you what was going to be a storm and there's a cloud, and the internet person would tell you what they're talking about this, and then went on to a distinguished career at NPR. And your latest book, Lisa, is on um, Up All Night. It is about the origin of America's news addiction and the birth of uh, CNN, which, which it turns out was very unlikely because it wasn't clear it was going to be successful at all. But here it is, the thing that is responsible for who we are today, always listening to the news. It's so hard to imagine, isn't it, Peter, that we weren't always connected? And yet, even when I met you 20 years ago when I was at the Times and the web was coming up, um, even, even then, the speed is nothing like it is now. But I wrote this book because when I was 17 years old, I had an internship at CNN, which was then, you may remember this, Peter, in the base of the World Trade Center in New York. That's where their first New York City Bureau was. It was a fishbowl. It was really arresting when you walked in. Um, and I, I had an internship there and New York City was not wired for cable then. So in 1981, it was a year after CNN started. And now here we are many years later, CNN's about to turn 40 on June 1st. And I started thinking a couple of years ago, how did it happen? Because I've only thought about how everything has accelerated since. And uh, looking at how Ted Turner pulled it off by buying a scrappy little UHF station, marrying it, or pu first putting it on cable as cable was coming up, and then cable marrying it to satellite after he heard what Jerry Levin and HBO were doing in their very, very first experimental phase and how hard it was for cable to get accepted back then. It's just, it's, it's impossible for us to imagine. Well, the cable part isn't impossible for us to imagine as everybody cuts the cord, but it, it's, it's such a phenomenal story that in our lifetime or in many of our lifetimes, as Craig was pointing out, that this speed has happened. And before CNN occurred, uh, things just, the news was at 6.30 at night. The uh, electronic media, which was just becoming electronic then, because of course, right before that, was it was all film. Uh, all of this has accelerated so rapidly and it really traces back to crazy Ted Turner, who really was not a um, news person. In fact, he hated news. He didn't trust news, not for the fake news issues, but he felt it was, um, he did feel it was too liberal. He was very conservative then, uh, but he was an innovator and he was an experimenter, a, risk, a huge risk taker. In fact, Peter, he's in the Apple commercial, the seminal, um, what's the tagline on the- Power to be your best. The, uh, the, no, uh, it, it's the oh, change- to Think different. Think different. Yeah, he's in. He's in that. I just watched it the other day. Um, anyhow, it, it's it's a really fascinating and thought provoking time to be thinking about what life was like before we could instantly get news. And CNN wasn't instantly adopted. It's really also important to remember that when CNN started, there were 18 million homes in the United States that had. Um, that had cable, there were only 2 million homes wired with CNN when CNN first launched on June 1st, 1980. So a minuscule, more people can see what we're doing right now than could at that point. This is and a really big deal. Right now, what we're doing here, much mm -hmm. easier to disseminate. By the way, when CNN came out, here it is, the thing that like Washington is just yaks about it. Washington, D.C. did not have CNN. Not only that, but let's look at this next slide. Daniel Shore, their preeminent correspondent who lived in Washington, could not get cable. His kids did not believe he was on television. So Daniel Shore in his backyard got that thing, that giant antenna, bigger than he is. You can see it on the right. 
This is a giant satellite dish, 10, 10 feet across. Had to stick one in his backyard so his family believed he was on television. And for a long time, you only had one of these if you had one of those until eventually DC, which was kind of pokey and slow, got wired, got cable, and then we saw CNN. I've been thinking constantly since this pandemic started about how, if it weren't for the technology, how would we get the information? And you, if, you, if you look at the pandemic of 1917-18, I actually listened to a terrific lecture by a public health uh, professor at one of the SUNYs, uh, SUNY Stony Brook, I think it was. And she talked about the dissemination of uh, preventative info and um just the the posters and the information that was spread in the news but in the newspapers but it's really phenomenal and someone will write a phd someday about that versus now and and really there are similarities of course and there are differences but when you think about just the idea of having a live truck in 1980 there was no such thing as a live truck there were microwave trucks but they didn't let you go very far. And of course you had to be a television station to have them, but uh, in very short order. And I only look at the first several years of CNN. I didn't go do a whole cradle to grave of the place. Um, you watch it evolve over time and uh, the technology mirrors it. CNN would not have been possible if it wasn't for videotape so and if we it was for satellites. We think of cable today as kind of politicized and, you know, they're yakking at each other. When it started, it was news, right? And then at some point, um, they started realizing that people arguing with each other, like that was good television. And right, and then it also had something to do with the fact that like CNN had news during crises and where there wasn't a crisis, you should invent something. So how did that all happen? In fact, it's really funny because when they started, when, when CNN, when Ted Turner's people were sitting around talking about what the heck can we do with this technology, somebody said, well, if we don't, if we do all news, what do we do when there isn't any news? How do we fill the time? Do we have to blow something up? And they were worried about it back then because what's new? Like Craig was just saying. What if I mean, there what isn't you, enough news? <laughs> what if there isn't enough news? And so they were genuinely worried. So they hired to fill the blanks and of course fill the overnights because they knew there really wasn't going to be anything going on then because CNN was not international then. What they did was they hired a bunch of commentators, people like Phyllis Schlafly. Um, oh gosh, it's slipping my mind too. So Ralph Nader was one of the early commentators. So they were basically in essence columnists like you would see in the McClatchy papers, except they were doing three minute essays um, to fill the time. And they also had a lot of feature kinds of things. If you may remember um, Elsa Clench, the style maven, she covered style. So, uh, they, and they had some rock critics. So that was how they were going to fill the time until something blew up or someone got shot or a space shuttle was going off. But what's so fascinating, and I wrote about it, there was an excerpt in Vanity Fair. Uh, in 1981, when President Reagan was shot, uh, basically, CNN was first to air to say that this had happened. It crossed the wires. That's how they knew. But it, it's so interesting to look side by side at how the networks reacted to the fact that this little chicken noodle news had put uh, this information. And that's all they knew was that he had been shot at. They didn't know even at that point if he had physically been hurt. But But there was this scramble, and I won't get into it here, about how each of the major networks looked at or, or, or treated it versus CNN. And it, it eroded over 10 years. It went from the, the careful, deliberate, we can't go on the air unless we have 10 sources to say, or f at least three sources that corroborate something, to exactly like you say, a bunch of people screaming. And the real seminal change, of course, was when Fox started. Because until Fox started, until there was competition in the 24-hour news space, they were just, yes, they had to fill the time. And an easy and very cheap way to fill the time is to have people like me who are willing to go anywhere to talk about their books come on the air. Or to people, people like any of the three of us will happily go on and talk about our point of view about something germane to our life's work. And so someone recognized that is a good time filler. And that, yes, deteriorated into I'll shout, we'll fight, we'll fight. That's more fun to watch. Um, I say in one of my, um, my excerpts or in the book that news became a sporting event. And 
it it mm. really is true. I mean, certainly our political elections are a sporting event. God help us. Um, just, I just want to point out that to show. Yeah. What wait, wait, Peter, I totally disagree with you about this. And Lisa, you're just wrong. That's, that's right. Just, that's <laughs> when we come me. back, we're going to come in. But to prove to you that I want both of you to stop outside. Stuff, that stop we have outside. an expert. We have found <laughs> one man in America who can connect up Rupert Murdoch's ownership of Fox with the Wall Street Journal, satellites, and having worked for, late, for CNN. Ladies and gentlemen, let's bring back Craig Foreman, who <laughs> in the early 1980s, was with Dow Jones when it pioneered the use oh. of satellites to become a national newspaper. It used the satellite earth station to stick printers all over the place. And the national newspaper happened because there was a CNN at the same time, same cause. And and Craig, you were at CNN and then Dow Jones now owned by the Murdoch people. So what was that founding moment like? And how did you use the technology at Dow? Well, well, I think Lisa points out something that was very true of Ted, which was he, he was fearless. He truly is fearless. And, you know, you, you don't win an America's Cup and start CNN if you have a lot of things that are inhibiting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Ted um, uh, also learned from others. So it really was Jerry Levin who first had the idea mm -hmm. of using satellite transponders for video. And I think it was the Thriller in Manila, the first HBO paid prize fight. That showed yes. the oh, technology Muhammad Ali. live real time sports. And Ted had visions of what ultimately became the MGM library. And a, a small note in Lisa's book, I think, is going to add a lot to the whole understanding of how all this happened. But some of the smaller networks, CNN FN, where I worked, CNN SI, in a fit of Time Warner corporate synergy, they were actually using the satellite transponder time that CNN had acquired expensively and that was empty in the overnight hours ah. to actually propagate the network. So some of the additional CNN spinoffs were really driven by the technology revolution and, and less driven by a vision that, oh, maybe a 24-hour a sports network could, could work. And, you know, hmm. we can remember... Uh, what's Peter? You're a better uh, media historian than I, but ESPN was Eastern Sports Programming Network. What was the entertainment? Network? Yeah, entertainment. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So you know, the original days of cable were very much like the original days of the internet, but a smaller group of people and far less diverse. Oh my God! Can older. I tell you a story about this? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, when I got out of college, I had to get a job. So I had an interview in New York with this crazy guy named Jerry Levin, who had just started HBO. And it was like him at a desk. And someone had set up the interview. And I was all excited because I was going to work for the media in New York. He goes, no, no, you don't understand. We're a franchise operation. We want to send you and some balloons to Pittsburgh. Because what you have to do is go to Pittsburgh with some balloons and some candy and throw a lot of parties at like stores or barber shops or wherever you can go and get people to sign up for what we have in Pittsburgh. And I'm like, I'm not going to Pittsburgh with balloons. But that's kind of what it was like back then. By the way, I, I have a place in Pittsburgh. I like I Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's um, a nice place. But I will say one one last point to Peter Singh. I, on the other the other day he mentioned that um, uh, one of the first things he had to do was write a business plan for Steve Case's brother, or no, for Steve Case, I guess, yeah. because they had a whole bunch of extra servers and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, which became AOL. Um, well, well, and, also, uh, and, and Mickey, I think just to jump in, like Ted, Steve realized the technology that had been used, time sharing, we were all familiar with acoustic coupler hmm. modems, could actually be used as a consumer service. And, you know, IBM, General Electric, Genie, the IBM and Prodigy, yeah. these were things that predated AOL, but without a consumer facing focus. And what yeah. Steve's great, and Steve and Ted and Miles and everybody else who was part of that had in, in some ways the same sort of insight that Ted had, which is you can use technology to be deeply engaging to a much broader audience. And that's why these technology revolutions we've all been lucky enough to be part of become such changing uh, developments for the way the world works. So Lisa, you look like you want to say something. I think we should bring Yal in too yeah. and just have uh, have more of a dinner conversation now. And, and maybe so, we can start to move on through. It's, it's become dark in New York now. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's yeah. Oh, it's, it's very cool. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's cocktail hour at this point, so it's quarantine it's, time. It's Friday. Yeah, it's eight, ten. Time. I and just we have cocktails here because it's cocktail hour there since we're like all connected. 
It's five o'clock somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I just have to say two quick things. A, Ted didn't really care about news. He just wanted to find something else to, to use this amazing confluence of, of cable and satellite. And yeah. Jerry had done entertainment. And besides licensing all that entertainment, as we all know, was a nightmare for different purposes. He wanted to do sports, but he didn't want to co-opt the sports that were really the mainstay of Channel 17. He kept buying all these teams, as you remember, or maybe some people don't remember. Um, so he didn't use sports. And so that he thought about music and someone said music on television is a totally <laughs> stupid idea. And so that's when he had the idea of news, but it wasn't that he was interested in news. And in fact, he was vociferously against news. But the other thing I want to Say about Jerry Levin is, and I was very lucky I was able to track him down because even the corporate HBO people don't have any institutional mm -hmm. memory. Well, so certainly they don't have the memory, but they don't have on their shelves, literally or figuratively, anything about what HBO was like on that very first day when Thrilla, when Thrilla in Manila happened in October, September 30th, I think. Um, 1975. And, and so Jerry Levin told me, and I had heard this somewhere else, but he, he corroborated it, that he had wanted to do news at HBO at time. And they, they were, they had commissioned a test from a, a little known news service that I write about in this book called TVN that was launched by Coors as a right-wing propaganda tool. And it wasn't a news channel, it was a news service. And they hired legitimate journalists to create video news, or then it was film news, to send out to member stations around the country. And the man who ran or ran a part of it for Joseph Coors was a man named Reese Schoenfeld, who wound up being the first president of CNN. But another man who worked there was a man named Roger Ailes. And basically, mm -hmm. Reese Schoenfeld, who was an expert on satellites, called um, was called by Jerry Levin, who rooted around looking for someone to do a pilot for him uh, for a news channel for uh, for time. And Re I, I would die to find this, by the way. Nobody's been able to find it for me. And Reese basically produced it. Oh, there we are. Look at him. Oh, my God. Um, Reese produced it, and the Jerry Levin's superiors at times said, "This is we just we're never going to do It'll this." Never fly. So anyway, it's a fun fact that it could have been HBO. There are there are a number of people thinking about it in the late seventies. Now it was you in Thrilla in Manila, and then I thought um, my early life was trying to demand anybody around me and my family would get us my MTV, and well. Just begging for it because ultimately we needed to see watch watch uh, Thriller, which was not thr the Thriller in Manila. It was Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. And, M Mickey, and the to try to, yeah. Mickey, to try to tie that together as Peter did in the intro. The one thing I'd say, and I think Lisa brought up, you know, so many of those, you know, fond memories and, and real leaders is I think Yale said this very well. Um, brands that have been created in the last twenty or thirty years, HBO, CNN. Fox News um, come, you know, brands that were created before the Miami Herald, the Sacramento Bee. But the power of social and Technorati showed the way, but certainly Facebook and, you know, distributed computing with these powerful, powerful broad reaches. Twitter has, yeah. has changed the ability of, of uh, brand creation and that audience creation. And you showed the OAN clip. And now mm -hmm. you can have something that appears to be a very professionally produced broadcast at, 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 at almost an infinite, infinitesimally trivial cost. Not that quarantine is produced at an infinitely, you know, at, 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 at an infinite, this is a well-produced, very slick. But we pretend uh, to look like TV also, right? Look at this. We're completely mimicking a form to, to build, build into your mind. This must be but television. When you, think, when you think about the cost of the satellite dish yeah. that Dan Shore had in the backyard of Georgetown or what Bill Dunn put up for the Wall Street Journal around the United States, to build on Barney Kildor, the prior CEO of Dow Jones, who said the businessman was true, quote, the businessman in Portland, Oregon, and the businessman in Portland, Maine, have the need for the same information. And the daily diary of the American dream, the Wall Street Journal, will bring that information to him. And Bill Dunn built the satellite network that did that, which was a great technology introduction. 
I think the thing that is a good crystallization is now social is so powerful and our, our information machines, what we're using is are so professional that it does change the way that those brands get created. And, and Yale's work is super interesting because using technology and targeting to instantly create a branded uh, audience it is a power that is is akin to a superpower. And to the solutions, mm. Yale, I was going to ask you, well, a simple solution, I'm just putting it out there, I'm not advocating, is the repeal of Section 230 of the 96 Telecommunications Act. So why don't you talk about that? <laughs> Sorry, you just said my favorite thing. <laughs> Um, I feel like you perfectly set me up for that one. Um, so before I get to section 230, because that gets super wonky, and I know you guys put it in the reading list, the last piece I wrote at Cornell Tech, which is like my entire thought on section 230. And a few people in the comments have been saying, what about that section? By the way, so just this, so people so know, okay. uh, if you go to quarantine.today, which is the homepage for this show, there's a reading list and discussion guide that has a lot of the background material. So all the wonky stuff that we're talking about in these studies and how information gets hijacked, it's all sitting there. Yell yeah, back to you. So before I get to that, I want to just kind of bring up one point that since, since I was the one who was saying all the scary stuff in the beginning, um, I want to just kind of, the key thing that I actually want to get to. So, um, Forgive me, Craig, I will get to your question in a minute. I'm just asking the questions, you know, just a journalist. No, I love it. I love it. I've been <laughs> loving listening to both of you. I'm so glad to be on with you guys. Um, listen, the thing I worked on at Facebook was political advertising. And so if I can, I want to make a point on that really quickly, because I want to also be really clear. It's not about hating social media. It's not about being a tech no pessimist or whatever. Like, I want these companies to succeed. But it's about wanting them to succeed without manipulating its users and without abusing its users and with taking responsibility for some of the real world harms that they cause. And that's where we get to 230. But on the political advertising front, you got you guys have each brought up freedom of speech at some point or, or the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And I really want to talk about how the idea of the First Amendment has been weaponized. So when we heard Mark Zuckerberg stand up and give his speech defending freedom of speech, uh, right after a lot of people, myself included, wrote and spoke these big pieces about their new political advertising policy, saying that they're not going to fact check um, political or candidates. And I was one of the people who that was what caused me to speak up and wrote my big piece about that. He gave this speech defending freedom of speech. And it was a complete false flag. And I really want to talk about why. Wait, so, what's a false flag? I mean, a false flag in the terms of, oh my goodness, maybe one of you will correct me if I don't define this correctly, but it's, it's, it's saying it's, it's like a ploy, I guess. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It, it's bullshit. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you, do, you do one thing and a lot of people believe, wow, they did it, but it's really a ploy. So you could keep doing this other thing. And mm -hmm. because it has the patina of truthiness to it or scientism, it sounds right. But a false flag is where you sort of raise a flag in one place to fool people so that you go and do something somewhere else, right? So we raise a flag about freedom of speech. How very ah, patriotic okay. Mark Zuckerberg, by the way, to yes. raise the flag about defending the great First Amendment. Let's be crystal clear. This is not free speech. This is paid speech. We're talking about political advertising. We're talking about politicians paying money to put out their advertising. So let's let's be clear about that. But more importantly, Whereas, and, and I'd love to hear Lisa or Craig's opinion on this, before a company like Facebook, a politician would pay for advertising space on a TV channel, on a network, in a newspaper, wherever it was. And maybe it's targeted towards everybody who gets that local news station. But that's about as much as it's targeted, right? It's, it's not, and anybody who has access to that Station sees the same app. On Facebook, if an if a politician wants to run an ad, he can micro-target that ad down to a level that is so specific to all of the human behavioral data they've gathered on us that I spoke about in the first third of tonight's show. That again, if it's Nike versus Reebok, I don't care. But we're talking about our our democratic pop process in our public square. 
Craig and I are probably getting two totally different versions of an advertisement Absolutely. from whether it be Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders or whoever. Okay, Craig and I are probably a little bit more like-minded. The person across the street from me, same zip code, maybe even same apartment building, because of their user profile on Facebook, because of the fact that they like cats, but I like dogs, they are going to see a different version of that ad, very likely. And how can you claim that polit they claim that political speech is the most scrutinized speech in the that already exists, so why would we want to be the arbiters of truth on that? You cannot scrutinize political speech if you and I are not seeing the same political speech in order to scrutinize it. So I just, so on the first thing is I call BS on saying we're not fact-checking political ads because we don't want to be the arbiters of truth, First Amendment, freedom of speech. I agree you shouldn't be the arbiters of truth, but let's be honest, the political advertising on Facebook using micro-targeting tools is not open free speech. But, but, you know, it, can I just point out something worse than this is the concept of political speech and not political speech actually kind of assumes a world where the distinction exists. Right now, I mean, what would you call the anti-vaxxers? What would you call people right. who identify right and then start putting stuff out? That stuff's just as powerful as anything else. This gets to fundamental issues about do we like curation or not? It goes back to Plato and do we like his philosopher king and having a few people help us understand stuff or do we like everybody? Or is everybody getting us closer to Hobbes where we're all nasty, brutish, and short because there's a mob, right? This, this so that's where we're getting to next with this. So now we come to COVID times. And I don't think I'll have time tonight to get into also the idea that it's free speech, that any schmo who just wants to say whatever they want, if their amplification tools amplify that to 2 billion people because he knew how to game the algorithm to write the salacious comment that is going to be amplified and your algorithm picks that up, that is boosted speech. That is amplified speech. That is your platform. We are not, this is not about a free neutral platform. That gets to section 230. They are curating our speech. Their algorithms are amplifying what they do and don't want us to see. But coming to COVID, to anti-vaxxers, to all of that, a great letter was sent by three senators just a few days ago by Senator Menendez, Kamala Harris, and Blumenthal asking Facebook, you, I recommend you read it. They asked them five questions and it was completely, and it had to do with this political advertising policy. Again, political ads are not the most important thing on Facebook. I actually think organic content is, but it shows who the company is. And they said, so since you said you will allow lies in polit from political candidates in their ads, but you said you will not allow lies about COVID, well, which is it? So if a political candidate wants to run an ad with misinformation about COVID-19, mm. about the health implications, about these things, are you going to allow that? Or when you say that you will not allow deep fakes and manipulated media on your, on your platform, but, and this is one of my questions to them that I tweeted at them once, but you are going to allow political candidates to lie in ads, does that mean if a political candidate decides to run manipulated media, synthetic media, shallow fake, deep fake, any term, pick your term, in a political ad, you're going to allow that because you're not fact checking your, and you know what? Read the Twitter thread because the response came back through a New York Times journalist. That yes, they will allow that because they will not fact check political candidates. So my prediction, the October surprise is going to be a particular candidate running for president who's currently president, dropping some very nasty synthetic media about his opponent in political ads, and he'll say he can do it because Facebook allows it. So these are some of the things, this is why people like to speak up. This is why we're so adamant about it, because it matters for elections, it matters for our democracy, it matters for how we view information. And then I'll just say, Craig, I would love to answer section 230, but it's all close to 30 and I don't want to take up all the time. Yes, I believe we need to absolutely redefine the rules that govern the internet. I don't think we need to scrap 230. I think there's a very smart way to consider amending it. And it's in the piece that they linked um, that I wrote. <laughs> Sorry, I don't right, want to- Right, no, and, 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 and Peter, I know that this is gonna go on, but just to help with that, section 230 governs liability in speech and common carrier rules that was part of the 96 Telecommunication Act, which is now 
you know, 15 years old and a lot of things have changed. So you cannot say that Facebook who curates our content, whose algorithms decide what to amplify is just a neutral carrier and should not have any liability. And I think there are whole new category and so you just you just released a, an article yesterday about this that we link on the site and i think it's worth reading one thing you mentioned when we were talking is you ended up having a bit of a an interesting conversation about a sheriff who was tweeting crazy things and twitter decided to take it down and they claimed that they were going to take it down because the so-called sheriff was actually going to cause harm so-called sheriff so, so yes. tell me about tell me about what like if you're going to cause harm to somebody, so Sheriff versus, Clark, yeah, he he's one of these famous guys on Twitter who purposely tweets really hardcore stuff to try to like stir the pot. He's got like a million followers, and he tweeted something a month or two ago, telling people go out, be in public spaces, like exact all this COVID disinformation, but also that could really threaten people. He's encouraging people to go out in public and not wear masks. So a bunch of people flagged it, and this is the thing, Twitter didn't catch it, it's people who sit there and spend all their time looking for this stuff, flag it. They eventually took that tweet down, but they didn't take it down because it was disinformation. They took it down under their policy of not inflicting harm or not causing self-harm, because if you listen to this advice, you will be causing self-harm by potentially getting sick. Why is that important? In my opinion, it's a way to, be responsible, take down this disinformation uh, about COVID-19, but not call it disinformation because we know that there's a big public outcry about why aren't you tackling disinformation on your platforms. They don't necessarily want to open the door for that responsibility. So when, this is just my theory. It was easier to take this as violating the harm policy the self-harm policy, as opposed to creating a new category. Saying, I suspect there's another Twitter user that that is causing a great deal of harm as well and has many <laughs> followers. But, you know, yeah, anyway, this is a very complicated space. I think we just, just tapped into it a little bit. And what I love about it is, I mean, there are people here who, have, who are there and in, in all these places. It is not something we can we can solve or litigate over, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an hour or an hour and a half. But it is such a beautiful... Thing to hear people so passionate about this. And also, you know, uh, Mark Twain said that, I, I like quoting, uh, you know, people who probably never said these things like Churchill and Twain. Um, uh, but he said, you know, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And I think we need to really understand um, what the next rhyme is going to be. Uh, because we're also doomed to repeat it if we don't. So <laughs> I, I think just to defend Churchill and that, Mickey, I think it's because he was half American that he actually did say that about America. But I take. Oh, I believe point, he did. Yeah. You know, I think that I think look, you know, here's the good news about this, right? Um, all of this has happened over this amazing period of time. Lisa writes about the start of CNN, yeah, you know, and you know, at the at the crucible of Facebook wrestling with all this stuff. We know we're entering into another cycle. Um, but we're still at the early days, right? I mean, we're still in the very early days of what this technology media telecom revolution is going to continue to evolve. Look at quarantine. We're, this is the crossfire of 2023. <laughs> this is By the way, I just I want to point out I just crossfire, right? I just looked so, in the in the comments. I want to clarify something. One of our one of our commenters said a false flag is a co-op covert operation designed to deceive. The deception creates the appearance of a particular group being responsible for some activity disguising the actual source of it. There you go, thank you, Amir. There, 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 um, there you go, the power. I, the, Mickey, I was just the internet brain. Say, I know you guys have an outro, yeah. but you know we're a digital news company, so it, it's oh, we're always on deadline somewhere, so I'm gonna bid you fond farewell, but with great <laughs> thanks, so keep thank going. Thank you, Greg. Keep Greg, we will, uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure, it's so interesting. W wonderful and, to see you all, thank you. And uh, let, whoever wants to stick around can stick around. Mick, I wanna uh, pose a thought here, which um, is, um, and you, and you probably have to go, yeah, Al, because because uh, you could tell yeah, us. Let's like, make sure, let's make sure everybody can go. Yeah. You know, Lisa, you I also do. look like I you really to want to say something. something. No, I've got to host something. I just want to thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to make your acquaintances and to see Peter again. And Nancy says she bought a copy of my book. Thank you, Nancy. And right. thank you. I, if, if anybody reads it, please uh, give me a call and let me know what you think about it because I think it's a really interesting period. By the way, we're going to have Nancy on soon. She's thank an you. expert in propaganda, 
uh, and public diplomacy. And in many ways, I think what we're doing in all of this in, in our community is a kind of a public diplomacy, not from a country, but from a movement to move things forward. So uh, our audience here is actually a big part of where we're headed, including uh, Richard Adler, who's from the Aspen Institute and part of the Communications and Society program. So we, we, we uh, and this is where I'm actually going to finish up with you, Mick, but if you guys have to go, you should go because you're on the East Coast. Next time we want to play when cable, I was cable when cable wasn't cool with Ted Turner. Have you oh, seen that nice. video? No. I'll send you the link. It's okay, great. We'll, we'll, do, we'll have one on this. All okay. Right. Bye, you guys. Thanks again. It was great meeting you, Mickey. Bye. And it was great seeing you guys again. Good to see you. Bye. All right. So I want to, bye bye. Thank you, Al. Well, that was great. Um, uh, I want to connect up um, where we're at now with where we ended up in the last show. Because you may remember in the last show, we were talking about kind of exponential forms of management. We had uh, Martin Reeves on, who is one of the senior people at uh, BCG. And then we had Elisa on, who is a recent graduate of Minerva. So this is a, a young woman mm -hmm. who, who um, uh, comes from Paraguay. And we were talking about how at this moment, when for the foreseeable set of months, students are going to be at home, right? And then uh, we're going to head into the fall. In the fall, there's not going to be the World's Fair in, in um, Dubai. You have all of this potential energy that's getting kind of tired at, of doing nothing or tired of being cooped up and people who really want to bring about a difference. And I would argue that the, the, the energy of people in this audience and the ability of people to come together might be that next note. It's, it's you know, clearly there's disinformation coming at us, but um, the organized group of people who would like to make a difference, who know how to use the tools of social media. And what I think is if, if you can actually get a whole lot of people conspiring to create hope and to go work on tomorrow, that's the that's the countervailing force. I don't think you take on hate with more hate or you do no. a counter counter operation to deceptions. I think you have to provide where we're going. By the way, this is in the American character. This is a this is a pretty exciting country when we're going to the moon or Reagan City on the Hill or, uh, you know, we're, we're inventing technology we believe in tomorrow. And we suck when we're scared in isolationism after World War um, uh, World War I or, you know, the Russians beat us with Sputnik and the McCarthy things going on or today. So you have to create that. And this is just a long way of saying that where we ended up last time, how do we hook this audience together, uh, have people collaborate on what the future looks like? create a whole bunch of X prizes, connect those things up, and essentially create a force of people that are working on what's next. Because let's face it, what's next is a tough thing to get to. This is- Yeah, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out is, um, hey, Omid, can you pull up the whiteboard? Yay, the whiteboard, let's see if, yeah. Let's see if things bad. are still going. It's now, I'm the only one who's been drawn on this lately, even though we have had a few guest drawers. Um, and I think everybody can draw, right? You just draw an, a blob for a for a noun and an arrow for a verb. This was today's conversation. Um, but if we pull back, we can actually kind of see the conversation from Martin on Wednesday, just above it. We can see each week. And one of the things we're going to do in a few weeks is we're going to invite everybody to click on the Miro board and actually do a collaborative, massive multiplayer um, experiment around trying to solve some of these problems. And so you'll use Miro, and there's a link on our site if you want to if you want to play play around with it. You can be completely anonymous if you want, or you can log in. We're not sponsored by them or anything. We're just experimenting with technology, um, but we're going to look for ways that we can actually do some collective collaboration and action as one of our episodes. And uh, in the in the hopes of starting to build uh, an ability for us to think through scenarios and look at complex systems. Um, so I thought that would be just worth everyone knowing about. Um, and even today, you can go on this this uh, this board and wind back the clock and look at this time machine uh, that started uh, all the way back. What what was our first episode? The the twenty. Fifth of March. March was our first first episode. And we had a synthetic biologist on, Andrew Hessel, um, telling us a little bit about what was going on with the virus. He, he basically said, in a sense, it's, it's like us versus the virus. It's a, it's a world war.
I drew a snow globe there just to help us understand it. Um, but also necessity is the mother of invention. There are some some wonderful things that are happening right now by people who who are locked in but but have wonderful brains. And we want to try to connect a lot more. I think Elise gave us the inspiration for this as a complexity researcher who's graduating class of 2020. Their, her graduation is next week, all digital. Um, and and said, you know, this next generation that's coming, you know, in some ways there's a lot of hope because they've they've been exploring complexity. There are there are now schools that actually start freshman year teaching you how to understand complex systems, and we're entering one of the most complex systems of all. I um I think we should end up talking a little bit about our own founding story here and how that moment may help us get to the next moment. First of all, to frame this, Tyler Hansen points out that a revolution is perhaps 3% of the population doing the same thing. And one of the things we saw on social media is that, you know, 1% of the people wrote the content, about 9% of the people retweeted and the rest watched, right? It doesn't take a whole lot to bring about change. And what did that nature study show us about disinformation? It showed mm -hmm. us a relatively small number of people who were committed to disinformation or committed to anti-vaccine just because they got started first and spent a lot of time on it, they're winning. So now what if the rest of us go spend time on it and we win and we work on it? So that's kind of where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And now to the founding mm -hmm. story of this whole thing, because quarantine did not start because you and I got together and said, let's do a show. It actually got started yeah. because on one of the first Saturday nights when this whole thing happened, my friend Erica Blair, who uh, you know, is a digital strategist and has planned online events, said, we have to do something because we got to get people to stay home. So she called a phone call with me and her friend uh, Patricia Parkinson, who's also been on, and Anna Malavoy, and they started something called Quarantine. They just self-formed mm -hmm. and said, we have to go to work. So Quarantine went off and said, we are going to... Um, go do a, a social distancing safety campaign. And these are some of the best digital strategies in the world. They got started kind of doing their thing. And they're like, well, Peter, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, well, we're gonna do a show because the, because I feel like we ought to just get con people connected up and see what was going on and what was well, interesting. Plus you've got you've got that cool digital reel-to-reel -reel behind or analog oh, reel-to-reel -reel behind you and all that. You just have, it looks to me like a news a news studio. And because because we could be a show. Okay, we could but, be. Yeah. Yeah. And also, <laughs> importantly, because we know Drew Young's. We know Drew Young's who wrote the Quarantine song. And that song That's true. that you hear at the beginning <laughs> and the end of the show, which everybody in the audience loves, although although Omid hates it. Everybody loves it. Uh, and I know that because it's a fact. That, that Drew wrote us a song that sounded like a show song, which, by the way, completely captured the zeitgeist of the time, which is stay home and what's going to happen when you stay home. I will tell you this, though. Last night, um, because I was, you know, we, we sit here and just, you know, binge watch things. I noticed that one of the new things on Amazon Prime, I think it's Amazon Prime, is, is the, all the episodes from the first season of Green Acres. And so I watched Eddie Albert and Jaja Gabor. Um, introduce how they were going to leave Manhattan and they were going to move to Green Acres to, 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 to have their life. And what's really interesting is that if you watch the first episode, it's actually all a Marshall McLuhan play. They have TV sets that they show up. They've got a reporter who's actually reporting on what each person said. It's the weirdest thing, um, but in a sense, it's a, it's a way to, to, to sort of take a picture and move it away from the world so you can look at it again. And uh, I, I think we might have to see if we can have a little snippet from Green Acres next. But when I was listening to it, you know, it's got this great uh, jingle. And when you had your friend come up with a jingle for this show, it's got that classic sort of 19, early 1970s kind of like, you're stuck at home. You might as well watch us. And, and, uh, and I think that that was kind of the heyday, whether it was, you know, uh, the Partridge family or the Brady Bunch or or, or uh, any of those back then of the jingle and the, and the beginning of it. And so once we had music, I guess we had to do a show. By the way, that music itself was an imitation of a show that NBC radio put on in 1956 called Monitor. Um, if you actually mm -hmm. Google the, 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 the song, which I think Buddy Rich played, which was the Monitor theme song, Drew mm. basically took that as an inspiration, rearranged it, rewrote the whole nice. thing. But we, we love that sound. We Monitor keep going was, backwards in history, I think. Yeah. Monitor was created because in 1956, radio networks were falling apart. They were in worse shape than newspapers mm. are today because everybody's watching TV. And 
Sarnoff, the founder of RCA and NBC, basically said, I don't know if we can fix radio. Except mm -hmm. Sylvester Pat Weaver, Sigourney Weaver's dad, who was the president of the network, came up with this <laughs> idea of what if they made a radio show that started Friday night, continued to Sunday night. So you could aggregate an audience over 72 wait, wait, hours. Wait, that was like a 24-hour radio show like Todd Turner. But this was in the 50s. Right. It was Earlier. the same. Comes right back around to this episode. And it brings us also back to the concept of the internet and of connecting people up. So the Monitor was the ins actually the inspiration for this show. Yeah. And the other person- And you can find the archives online. We'll put them on our site. Um, it's kind of or it's stunning. Peter sent me the first clip and I just started listening to it. And I was like, this is fascinating. They've got like live performances and segments and clips and it's the fifties uh, and it's captivating. You can kind of dip into it and dip back out of it. It was again. the beginning so, of the notion of stitching together an ongoing uh, global audience in which you could tune in and tune out, drop in and drop out. It wasn't so much mm -hmm. bounded by a show that started and ended. It was just there, mm -hmm. not unlike CNN, which brings us to the final point tonight. Uh, we can't get out of here anytime without bringing up Marshall <laughs> McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan. And last night on Lisa Napoli's page, she was preparing- We're supposed to, to drink every time you say Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> we need beer. I, I totally- no, water, About 10 o'clock at night, on, on Lisa Napoli's page, she posts, um, you know, some question of, you know, who is responsible for misinformation? Is it the media or whatever? Discuss, I guess, preparing for this. And Michael Markman shows up and says, uh, Marshall McLuhan was wrong. The medium is not the message. The audience is the message. McLuhan had it wrong. Um, hmm. But actually, I think both Markman and McLuhan had the same point here, which is, when McLuhan says the medium is a message, he means it's the nature of the technology that sets the grammar that defines it. The message of three TV networks is a mass audience. The message of mass advertising is you're gonna, everyone's gonna have a more similar opinion. As recently as 1940, the American Political Association, which is the political scientist said, Americans have too much in common. The parties aren't distinct enough. We need to have more conflict. And that was because the message of the medium was you know, mm. three networks. Well. Now we come to what's the message of social media when there's just so many voices? And clearly it's 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 diversity or pluralism or however it kind of devolves into. That's the message of the medium. But the real question is one of technological determinism and architecture. It's like, is this technological determinism? There's a lot of voices which just sentenced to a bunch of crap. Well, probably not because architecture is destiny and that's where we have system architects and ethicists and people who design systems for a living. And if we design systems to work and enliven us, we're better off. That brings us back to the founding moment in quarantine. Quarantine was a whole bunch of people who got together to try to make things better. And today I was on the phone with that same team. I said, here's what we've been up to the last couple of months. And they're all sitting off there trying to figure out how do we build for tomorrow? How do we get better ideas out there? How do we spread ideas? So I guess what I'm saying is there's a conspiracy to deceive us, but the conspiracy for good, the conspiracy to put things together and get it right, that's a really big conspiracy. And everybody who's part of that conspiracy is bored out of their minds, looking for something to do and figuring that the future they have to go into ought to be a better one. And that's what we, that's what we all have to do. That's what we said the show is going to be about uh, three shows from now, Wednesday a week, when we're going to get together and design this. But I kind of want to leave everybody that where we're headed in all of this is some confluence of media and designing the future that, that we're responsible for. Um, and, you know, what we saw today was a whole bunch of this media history that takes us to this moment. And from here on end, it's up to us, which is, of course, what the second show was about. The commander is us. Yeah. Your turn. I got nothing. I think it's time to. I think it's time to listen to Drew night. Young's song. Yeah, to thank you. Great. We'll see you again on Wednesday. What a um, great group of guests today. That was so fun. That was great. This is Quarantine. We're at quarantine.today. Omid's probably going to put that up so you can find it. If you go to our webpage, you will find all of the articles we use for this show and the last two shows. So if you saw Martin Reeves last time, he quoted some amazing literature that tells us where management and strategy is going. If you read that stuff, you will get hired and you'll be really cool for whatever your next job is. And also
whatever the next world is. And the show before that, when we talked about the future of cities, all of the stuff that Kent Larson and, the, and a lot of the city stuff that we did and what's going to have the downtowns, it's all there. And we're going to see. By the way, we, do, we now have a reading list and resources. Uh, one thing I want to ask Mohi, uh, uh, Omid to maybe add up there is today I happened to, when we were talking to Yael, we were talking about strip mining cognition. And there's a wonderful piece by Marco Nunziata, one of our previous guests and fellows with, with Yael at Autodesk, who's a, a global um, macroeconomist, uh, and, and I helped write it as well, called the Great Cognitive Depression instead of the Great Economic Depression. And I'd recommend everybody read it who's interested in maybe creating a, an FDA or an EPA for the mind, because I think we might need it. That's right. Uh, okay, we could just keep going. Agnieszka Pilat says the Museum of Ice Cream is the future. Well, clearly, I'd, I'd agree with that. That totally is true. Yeah. It, it was the future. You know, <laughs> place-based immersive media was the future before all this started. Like, like we thought the Museum of Ice Cream was content-free place-based media. But the question is, is anyone going to go out again? Because the thing about the Museum of Ice Cream is everybody clumped together in a big room. Okay, we're going to design the future, and then we're going to go figure out if we all get to be in it or if we have to do the future from home. And on that note, have a wonderful Friday. It's 546 Pacific Corn Time. We'll see you Wednesday. Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share from a distance. Quarantine. No, we want to see each other. Let us stay in your home. Time, space, while we talk. Let's go.